Yes. Uh, we hope to do this three nights a week until at least until the quarantine is over. We'll be looking at Bhagavad Gita. My name is Siddheshwar Das. I'm a disciple of Siddhasarupananda Paramahamsa. And uh, before we go any further, I'd like to offer my respectful obeisances at the lotus feet of my spiritual masters, Siddhasarupananda Paramahamsa and Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasadaya Bhutale Srimate Siddha Swarupananda Paramahamsa Iti Namine. Namo Bhaktivedanta Swami Namine Gaur Karana Swarupaya Radha Krishna Prasadaya Te. Manchakalpa Trivyascha Kripasindubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanevyo Vaishnavevi Namonama Vajashi Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adwaita Gadadhar Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Okay, thank you again for joining us. We're going to look, uh, you know, a lot of us are familiar with Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita as it is, um, but some of us don't know the context of Bhagavad Gita. Not that it really needs a context because the teachings are universal. However, uh, there are some very interesting stories and very interesting points to Bhagavad Gita and the, uh, and the events that led up to it. Um, the Pandavas, oh, before I get started on that, I want to diverge just for a second. The other day I got a, I got a very um, heartfelt message from a student that comes to the Binyan Center from time to time. And she said, please help me. I have no money. I have no milk for my baby. And I have no diapers. And there was nothing I could do. We're all under quarantine. So I can't get out. She couldn't get out, but it reminded me of something. And that is that a lot of times we tend to think when we become interested in devotional service that, oh, if I just surrender to Krishna, then my life will be sublime. That's true. But that doesn't mean that there, <laughs> that there won't be any material suffering. Um, the Pandavas suffered greatly. They were, they were condemned to live in the forest for years, uh, as was uh, um, Prahlad Maharaj was thrown into pits of snakes and, and, uh, and cages of lions and so forth. Haridas Thakur was beaten through 30 marketplaces. Even Lord Jesus also suffered the pangs of people's envy. So the point is not that you will somehow, you know, not be subject to any kind of physical suffering. The point is that as a devotee, you know that Krishna is your friend. You know that Krishna loves you. You know that Krishna will always uh, give you what is best for you whatever that may be, whatever that may be. And in giving one, our life to our spiritual master and to Krishna, uh, then we simply understand that our understanding is that no matter what we are going through, this is, this is Krishna's mercy. Haridas Thakur, all he could do was just chant Krishna, 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 until finally the, the guards who were beating him up said, please die. If you don't die, then, you know, the king will, will kill us. And Haridas, you know, he was absorbed in Krishna and he said, oh, oh, okay. And he promptly seemed to die. Went into Samadhi, went into uh, 
you know, seemed seemed like all of his bodily functions ceased. And they were very relieved. They threw him into the ocean where he was revived and came back and chanted more. <laughs> but we see this over and over again, this theme, the, the Pandavas, um, while they were, they were in the, they were relegated to the forest because the Kurus, the sons of Dhritarashtra, tried to kill them by burning their, a house that they had built for them and presented to them as their wonderful vacation palace which they intended all the time to burn to the ground. The Pandavas had built uh, a, an escape route so that when the, uh, when the place burned down, they were not there. They, they escaped through a tunnel. And, but they wanted everyone to think that they were dead, so they, they went to, into the forest in exile. While the Pandavas spent many, many years in exile in the forest. Um, this first time, Krishna, along with Arjuna, among the many things that they did, they burned down the forest at Kandava. Agni, the god of fire, had asked Krishna and Arjuna to help him to consume the forest, which was under the uh, jurisdiction of another demigod's protection. This forest was full of demons and snakes, which is Agni's food. And when Agni asked Arjuna and Krishna for help, they agreed. <clears throat> now, at that time, a demon known as Mayasura was living in the forest. When the forest was lit on fire, this Mayasura ran out and Krishna aimed his chakra at him to kill him. But Maya didn't fall at the feet of Krishna. No, Maya fell at the feet of Arjuna, seeking protection. Arjuna then asked Krishna not to, not to kill Mayasura. Maya, the demon, sought forgiveness and shelter from these two great warriors, and he accompanied Vasudeva and Arjuna, Krishna and Arjuna, back to their forest home. Later, after the Pandavas finally revealed themselves at the Swayambara of Draupadi, they returned from the forest with their new wife, Draupadi, and to try to bring peace, Dhritarashtra and Bhishma decided to divide the Kuru kingdom and give a good part of it to the Pandavas. Theoretically, this was to, uh, you know, make everybody happy. What they failed to mention when they gave this, you know, generously, <clears throat> we're going to give you like half of our kingdom, and you know, you can you can uh, you can rule over this Kandava Prasta, uh, you know, as long as you want. What they failed to mention was that Kandava Prasta was a desert. There was nothing there. It was just completely bare of life, no water. It was almost impossible to grow any crops there. However, Yudhisthira and the Pandavas gratefully accepted this gift of Kandava Prasta. And when Krishna saw the situation, he said, I think I know what I can do. I'll help out. And so he called Indra and Indra appeared in a flash of lightning. And Krishna said, please bring water, bring bring vegetation, bring wealth to this Kandava Prasta and build a city here, a city that we shall call Indra Prasta, the city of Indra. 
And so Indra did all these things, brought water, brought life, brought birds and animals, built the city. And the Kurus, Duryodhana, Dusasan, and his 98 brothers were very, very upset, very, very, very upset because they had, you know, they thought that, again, they thought that they had gotten the better of them, given them this desert, but, and it turns out that it's actually more, more wealthy, more rich in life than their own place. And a lot of the people from, from the Kaurava kingdom decided to move to Indraprastha. This gave them all kinds of worry and, and uh, envy. So Mayasura, he wanted to pay back the mercy that Krishna had bestowed upon him. When he asked what he could do, Krishna asked him to build a marvelous assembly hall for the Pandavas. Maya was an architect of the Asuras and he had built many phenomenal uh, palaces and assembly halls in the heavenly planets. He belonged to a class of celestial architects who were known as Vishwakarmas. After the original architect of the universe, they were excellent craftsmen. And in no time, an assembly hall, uh, a palace that was befitting Yudhisthira's stature was proposed. And Krishna asked Maya to put in all of his architectural skills to make it a world-class structure. Maya sought permission from Yudhisthira to travel to Mount Kailasha where he, where there was a beautiful lake called Bindu. And in this lake, Maya had uh, a treasure load of just a, the whole lake was filled with beautiful precious stones. And the demon king, Vish, Vishaparva ruled there and gave Maya permission to retrieve his stones and with the help of some two or 300 demons or asuras, he brought back the treasure and set to work on this great hall. All the precious stones were studded throughout the hall. The grand highlight was a beautiful pond in the center of the, of the uh, palace, which he had exquisitely carved in such a way that you couldn't tell where the floor was and where the um, water was in the pond. The pond reflected the floor so, so well that it looked like the, the floor continued right into the pond. This of course was not the case. The assembly hall was beautiful and it was filled with magical things like that. There were doors that seemed to be open that were actually closed. There were doors that seemed to be closed that were actually open. The, the walls would change color. The, 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 uh, uh, the jewels would, would sparkle and reflect the light in different colors and different ways. It was an amazing place. Tall pillars carved out of gold and about 8,000 Asura soldiers were employed to guard the palace. This is very interesting, I think, because we tend to think that the Asuras would, why would the Asuras, why would the demons work with, work with the Pandavas who were on the side of Krishna? But here we see that they could actually work together. It gives us some hope for our modern day politics. After a total of nearly 14 months, it finally was ready and was called the Maya Sabha, the Hall of Illusions. As the ruler of what was now called Indraprastha, Yudhisthira decided to perform the Rajasuya Jaga, the Rajasuya sacrifice. He sent all of his brothers to conquer the various parts of the world. And after they did so, he performed this amazing sacrifice and he invited kings and princes and queens from all over, including Duryodhana 
and Dhritarashtra and uh, Sakuni. And when they arrived, they were just amazed and baffled by how phenomenal, how beautiful and rich this palace of Indraprastha was where they had thought that they had just given him a desert. And this, of course, simply increased Duryodhana's jealousy towards the Pandavas. Now, after the, after the uh, Rajasuya sacrifice was performed, this made Yudhisthira the king of the, the emperor of the entire world. That was the point of it. And at the end of the sacrifice, someone in the sacrifice, in the audience, and they had Narada was there, they had uh, Brahma, Shiva, all the, all the demigods, they were all there along with these kings and princes and everybody. Someone was to be worshipped by Yudhisthira. This was the, the denouement, as it were, of, of, the, whole, of the whole ceremony. <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Bhishma, many people were, you know, Many people were nominated. Many people said, oh, Narada should be worshipped by Yudhisthira. Oh, no, no. Shiva should be worshipped. No, no. Brahma is the creator of the world. No, he should be worshipped. Finally, Bhishma, grandfather Bhishma, stood up and said, the only one here who is really worry, worthy of Yudhisthira's worship is Krishna. And he delineated why Krishna, being the supreme personality of Godhead, the source even of Vishnu, and so forth, was the one who should be worshipped. And this was agreed upon by most of the people there. I say most because there was a group headed by this uh, rather foolish, uh, yet much a great warrior, military uh, king named Sisupal. And Sisupal uh, never liked Krishna. And as a matter of fact, when he was born, his mother was told that Krishna would kill him. And so she went to Krishna with her baby Sisupal and she said, please, you are the master of the universe. Please do not kill my son. And Krishna said, I tell you what I can do. I will forgive 100 times any offense that he may commit, any affront, any insult. No problem. I will forgive 100 of these. Well, it just so happened that Sisipal had used up all 100 of his insults. And uh, so after Sisipal made this, you know, why should we worship this idiot? He doesn't, he's not even a king. He went on and on and on about how Krishna was not worthy of worship and about how this and that. Finally, Krishna just got up, took his chakra and cut his head off. This gave Duryodhana a chance to be pissed off for like, you know, gave him a reason to be uh, upset. And so Duryodhana uh, and some followers uh, of Sisupal uh, protested and decided that they would leave the ceremony in protest. And so they started walking out the door. Now, Duryodhana wasn't all that familiar with this uh, Maya Sabha. And he, he, uh, he took his own, once he left the, the, the assembly hall in the center, <clears throat> he took his time uh, upon leaving to look around this palatial hall. And uh, he came into this room where there was this pond and, uh, and it looked like the floor just went, 
you know, right on over the pond. In fact, you couldn't even see the water. It looked like a solid floor. And so Duryodhan and all of his armor and all of his uh, regalia and everything just walked right into the water, fell into the water, all the way up, all the way up over his head, fell down and stood up in complete disgrace. The Pandavas were there up above on the, on the, on the balcony, above a staircase, above looking, they happened to be there, uh, you know, doing something. And Draupadi was there and Draupadi said, look, the blind man, the son of the blind man is also blind. This again, pissed off Duryodhana no end. Because, you know, why is Duryodhana always so pissed off, you may ask? Well, it's because he felt that he was the rightful king. He was the son of King Dhritarashtra, but Dhritarashtra was blind and therefore was disqualified to be the emperor. Dhritarashtra was kind of like the, uh, like the, the guy in charge, but not a king. And the Pandavas, however, had uh, the best claim to the throne because Yudhisthira was born before Dhritarashtra. And therefore, being the firstborn uh, of this uh, family, he was rightfully the king. This also did not sit well with Dhritarashtra. And uh, Dhritarashtra, I mean, Duryodhana and Sakuni and, and Dusasan and all the brothers uh, stormed out. And as, as Duryodhana was leaving, he went through a door that appeared to be open but it was closed. And so he banged into the door and fell down. And then he avoided another door that he thought was closed, but was open. And so as he was leaving, the laughter, you know, followed him right out the assembly hall and just humiliated him no end. See, I think I have another picture of Duryodhana. Oh yeah, there it is. Duryodhana in the, uh, the pond again. And um, whoever's got your microphone open, please close it. Somebody has a microphone open? Okay, good. So this all did not sit well, and the Pandavas were ruling now the entire world. <laughs> the Pandavas were ruling the entire world and this was not sitting well at all with Duryodhana. Yeah. He tried to ask tried to to Please uh, mute your microphones, everybody. If you, if you tune in, Mute your microphone. We're getting all kinds of echoes and stuff. So please mute your mic, okay? Thank you. So Dhritarashtra asked, I mean, uh, Duryodhana asked Dhritarashtra, his father, if he could perform the Rajasuya sacrifice, but, but his father said no. And so Sakuni and Duryodhana made another plan to defeat the Pandavas. They decided to invite, they built, a, they built their own palace and they decided to invite the Pandavas to Hastinapur and uh, challenge Yudhisthira to a game of dice, a game of gambling. Of course, not knowing their cruel plan and basically decide, thinking that it was just, you know, to celebrate this, uh, this uh, new building, they went. Sakuni had magical dice that were actually made from the bones of his ancestors. And every time he rolled the dice, they would come up whatever he wanted. 
And so the Pandavas slowly, throw by throw by throw, lost everything. They lost their wealth. They lost their jewelry, their chariots. They lost Indraprastha. They lost the emperorship. And soon Yudhisthira lost even his brothers and himself and even his wife, Draupadi. In the end, as a crowning humiliation, they had lost everything in front of so many people. And, you know, this was Duryodhana's revenge. Dusasan went to, Dury to Draupadi's chambers and grabbed Dupati and dragged her into the court and attempted to dis <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, attempted to disrobe her in public, to undress her in public as the crowning embarrassment. Um, however, when Dusasan did this, she took shelter in Krishna, praying to Krishna, I can do nothing. Please, please, dear Krishna, help me. And to this end, Krishna uh, magically added more and more cloth to her sari. So the more Dusasan pulled on her sari and then tried to undress her, the more sorry there was and it never ended so finally they were tired and they gave up in the end i think it was vidura suggested that they have one more throw of the dice and if the panda was lost they would have to enter into exile for 12 years and then they would have to live for another year incognito so that no one would know if anybody found them in that year, if anybody could identify them and say, oh, you are the Pandavas, they would be exiled for another 12 years plus one. After they actually survived 13 years in exile, Duryodhana, Karna, and Dusasan and, and the Kauravas thought that they, they had them. They attacked them in the city that they were in. Arjuna, uh, it's kind of a long story, but he was actually uh, a eunuch. He was disguised as, as a homosexual, well, not a homosexual, but an asexual eunuch who, uh, I mean, it was complete, it was the best disguise in the world uh, for a great warrior like, like Arjuna. But in any case, on the very last day of the exile, the Kauravas found them and they attacked the city where they were only to find out from Vidura just before the fight that they were a day late because that was a leap year. And therefore, there was one extra day in the year and therefore they were a day late in, in uh, discovering the uh, Pandavas. This time, after another 13 years in exile in the forest, they came back and they sought to claim their right to at least half of the Kaurava kingdom. But this time, Duryodhana wouldn't even give them a desert. He said, I will not give you even so much land as I could put under my finger. Good luck. Really showed his true colors. The Pandavas then sought counsel from Krishna, what to do, where to do, how, did, how, how could they, what should they do about this? Krishna offered and was agreed, agreed to uh, represent them in peace talks, that he would, he would go as their representative uh, and negotiate with the Kauravas to try to uh, try to get them to come to come to their senses, try to get them to uh, uh, 
to realize that it was Eudasir who had the uh, at least the birthright of at least half the throne, half the uh, the kingdom. However, Krishna spent about three nights in Hastinapur. He stayed with Vidura. Duryodhana and Dusasan and Karna offered their offered their uh, quarters to Krishna, but Krishna refused to stay in them, saying that they were already dead. And they just didn't know it. And um, during this time, Krishna met with Karna, a very interesting meeting, because as it turned out, Karna was the firstborn son of Kunti. And that's a long story, but Krishna basically said, look, you can end this. You can end all of this. Take your place as the firstborn son of Kunti. Become king. Become the emperor. And Yudhisthira will follow you. Duryodhana will follow you. Everyone. This could all end just like that. But Karna refused. He said that he had given his life to Duryodhana. And whatever Duryodhana wanted, he was bound by his sworn oath to protect. Again, we see first the demon Maya goes to Krishna's devotee to plead for mercy. And now Karna is offered everything by Krishna himself, everything that he might have ever wanted. The respect that he never had. Again, long story. But his devotion was misplaced. It's the difference between devoting oneself to something, to something material or someone temporary and devoting oneself to Krishna. This is bhakti. And again and again and again and again, even in the Mahabharata, even as we're coming up to the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata teaches this truth in so many ways. Meanwhile, Duryodhana and Sukuni and Dusasan and the brothers were like, Duryodhana is thinking, I, I don't know, you know, Krishna is so much a part of the Pandavas, the Pandavas is so much a part of Krishna. I don't know if we can defeat them in a war as long as Krishna is on their side. And so Dusasan, in his inimitable wisdom, said then we should capture Krishna and put him in jail here while he's here. We can capture him. Without Krishna, the Pandavas will be completely destroyed. Their, moral, their morale will be gone. They won't be able to do anything. Duryodhana thought that was a brilliant idea. And so, later that morning, when Krishna came into the, uh, into the court, uh, they yelled at each other. Krishna yelled at Duryodhana. Duryodhana yelled at Krishna. And Krishna said, okay, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. And Duryodhana said, capture him. <laughs> like anyone can capture God. Again, this is shown again and again in the scripture. But what happened then was that Krishna grew in size until he almost filled up the entire hall. And from his eyes came Shiva and Brahma. And from his mouth came uh, Indra. And, and uh, uh, all the different demigods came from different parts of his body. And he exhibited part, not all, but part of his universal form to Duryodhana until Duryodhana was, was, you know, crying and, and cowering in, the, in his seat, hoping that this, this huge monstro monstrous form would not kill him. Seeing this, Krishna 
resumed his original form and left. So then Krishna went back to the Pandavas where they were encamped. They had no home or anything. They were still homeless. And he said, he told them what happened and the battle of Kurukshetra was inevitable. Krishna told Yudhisthira that as the rightful king, he had a duty to uh, take what is rightfully belongs to the Pand Pandavas. And if the Kauravas would not give it up, then it was his duty to fight for it, for him, for Krishna. He said it is, you know, he as much as said it is his will. Actually, many times he, uh, he says that this, I, he, say, he told Yudhisthira, I will go to Hastinapur and I will speak on your behalf, but it won't do any good because this is God's will. Uh, so these are some of the background stories that predicate or predate the Bhagavad Gita. As you know, once there were like seven or eight Akshokinis of soldiers <clears throat> on one side and nine or ten Akshohini on the other side. And they filled this huge battlefield of Kurukshetra with literally millions of soldiers, elephants, <coughs> horses, <coughs> excuse me, weapons, and everything. By the way, that's that's not a dry cough. That's not a virus cough. It's a, it's just some gullagullas in my throat. So don't don't worry. <laughs> and um, and so, Arjuna, looking upon the battlefield, asking Krishna to take him up between the two armies before the battle started. Millions of people on one side and a separation, and then millions of people on the other side, weapons, elephants, horses, wagons. Arjuna looked at the people that he must fight, at the people that he must kill. He saw his teacher, Dronacharya. He saw his brothers, Duryodhan, Dusasan, the Kurus. He saw his uh, devoted wise man, Bhishma, the great warrior who instructed them in so many ways and who was so dear to them. And he knew that this was going to be bad. And so he thought to himself, what is the point? Even if we win, if we kill all these amazing people, if we kill all these people that we've, we've known all of our lives, yes, they may have done this or done that, or they may have said this or said that, but what's the point? What do we gain? And he looked at it and he just said, this is not, this is not worth any, this is, this is not worth it. This is foolishness. And he took off his, his arrows, threw down his bow, and he said, Krishna, I will not fight. And he sat there in the chariot, dejected, and thus begins the Bhagavad Gita, which we will talk about next time. Okay? Namaste. Haribo. If you have any questions, please use the chat.
or open your microphone. There must be a question. Come on, you guys. <laughs> Haribo. Namaste. I've been looking at you. Haribo. Good to see you. Uh, it's Bhagavad Gita, a part of the Vedas by Vyasadev. Is Bhagavad Gita part of what? The Vedas by Vyasadev. Um, the Bhagavad Gita was uh, written by Vyas, but it's actually part of the Mahabharata. which is the, uh, wait a minute, I got to switch this in order for you to read it. The Mahabharat, which, uh, yes, was uh, put, to, uh, put to paper by Vyas and, uh, and uh, Ganesh. Uh, and it is part of the Vedas, the Vedic literature, but it is uh, the only well, aside from the Puranas, it's 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 sometimes uh, uh, it's it's sometimes li listed among the Puranas. The Puranas are Vedic teachings in story form, where it tells the story of a different demigods or or someone like that, and the teachings are made within our our you know, kind of built into the story, as it were. So Mahabharat is the largest, it's, it's often said that it's the largest uh, uh, epic poem in the world ever. Nothing even comes close, but it contains the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of God. And that is the heart of the Mahabharat. And the the basic teachings of the Vedic of the Vedic literature of Vaishnava Bhakti, all of that is there in Bhagavad Gita. If you don't have one, get one. If you need, if you want to, if you can download it, I mean, I I have it. I can send it to you to download. I I don't. I think I gave away the only one that I had to someone who really needed it um in book form but if uh, if anyone wants uh a downloadable form of bhagavad gita that they can read on online then uh, just let me know i'll send it to you i have that and i have many other scriptures does that answer your question okay thank you thank you very much Haribo. any other questions please Let's see, who have we got here? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, goodness, okay. I didn't see the chat here. Ha! Goodness, there's a lot of questions here. Jerry de la Pena. Why Lord Krishna wants Arjuna to fight in the battlefield of Kurukshetra war? And what does it mean when Sri Krishna also mentioned in the 11th chapter of the Gita that I've already killed these people? You are but an instrument. Well, Jerry, to be honest with you, that's that is the that is the case of all um, devotees. That we want to do, we want to serve Krishna. We want to be his instrument. And Krishna is basically saying, "You couldn't have stopped this war." Krishna said that this war is something that I have already brought about. And Arjuna couldn't stop the war. And just like, like, like he said, you know, he said, this is ridiculous. I don't want to do it. I'll go to the mountains. I'll meditate. I'll, I don't want to, I don't want to fight. I will not fight Krishna. 
And so the rest of the Bhagavad Gita is basically telling Arjuna why you should fight in this case. Not that you should fight every war just because there's a war, but because in this particular case, and this is, this is the unique beauty of the Bhagavad Gita in terms of spiritual scripture, that even the worst thing that we can think of to do, kill people, even the worst thing that we can think of to do can be done in the service of God. That, he, that we can be his instrument even in this uh, very perplexing and difficult and political situation. And that there is a side that God does have a side. God does have an opinion. God is not just there, you know, saying, okay, whatever happens, happens, blah, 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 blah. No. God is the supreme controller. And if Arjuna had decided to go to the mountains and, and decided to, you know, live in a cave and wear a loincloth and forget about this whole battle thing, it still would have happened and the people still would have been killed. So the question is, do you want to be a part of Krishna's, uh, Krishna's Leela, as it were? Krishna's, uh, uh, do you want to serve Krishna's will? Or do you simply want to serve your own will? This is why, one reason why silent meditation uh, in this age doesn't work that well because it's really selfish. It's just you're all you're trying to do is get away from your own suffering, and it's not it's not engaging. If we if we look if we look on a practical level at all living beings, whether they're bugs or whether they're flowers or trees or people or animals, they're all engaged in serving something, whether it's their senses or or whatever it might be, their senses or their, or their, uh, uh, their families, their whatever. When, when a flower blooms, it's not thinking I'm blooming to glorify God, but that's really what it's doing. That's really what it's doing. It may be thinking, well, I'm blooming so I can get a, uh, an insect to come and pollinate and pollinate, you know, the next flower over or, or you know spread my spread my seed as it were but if you look deeper everything that exists exists at the will of god and and it exists to glorify god the flower growing glorifies god everything that we do should be done with the consciousness to glorify God. The, the flower has no consciousness of this. The monkey has no consciousness of this. The dog has no consciousness of this, the insect. But we are unique as human beings. This is the, the phenomenal uniqueness of humanity that we have the ability to engage and offer our service, our sacrifice, our uh, talent, our whatever to God, to Krishna. Everything that you do, all that you, all that you do, all that you offer and give away, all that you taste, all that you, everything, do it as an offering unto me, Krishna says. And that is the unique position that we are in as human beings. Another question from Ananda. I, I hope, Jerry, that, that, uh, that answers your question. Um, Ananda says, was it a universal form that Krishna showed to Duryodhana when they attempted to capture him? It was part of. Uh, the reason I, I make this distinction is because it, it said very clearly in the Bhagavad Gita that no one had ever seen anything, this, this, this universal form that Krishna revealed to Arjuna. This had never been shown to anyone before. 
Um, so in the palace in Hastinapur, Krishna only showed him a little bit, little bit of that, of the universal form. It was not, not nothing, nothing where he was eating all the worlds and creating all the worlds and doing all of this and that. No, he just basically showed him that he was the, 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 the sum total of all the demigods and he is the, the a hell of a lot more powerful than Duryodhana. And that was basically the point. He didn't need to show the whole thing. He showed the whole thing to Arjuna and that scared the hell out of him. So, you know, he didn't need to uh, go all that, go that overboard with Duryodhana. Duryodhana was a coward anyway. Uh, someone says, let's see, Choi says, I have no audio. Hari Bol, I have no audio. Uh, Chaitanya Das or Balaram, you're the only one I know that can help if, if you can help at all. Choi, it's probably something to do with your own, your own setup. You might have your own microphone muted or you might have the speaker. Oh, you can go to, uh, you go to settings and then you go to audio and then you can uh, set up your audio. So maybe that'll help. Well, we hear Choi. I don't know if Choi's gonna hear us. Anyway, uh, Daryl Robertson. Um, let's see. Do we pay obeisances before reading Bhagavad Gita? Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Uh, or is this for Srimad Bhagavatam and other scriptures written by Srila Vyas? Uh, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya is, I've, used, I've heard it mostly used in connection with Srimad Bhagavatam, but I, would, uh, I wouldn't think that it would be uh, disruptive or or uh, offensive to use it anywhere with regards to any scripture. Okay, also Daryl says, was Mali Ashoda not shown the universal form by Krishna when she was eating, when he was eating his amud? No, no, that was described very differently. Uh, when, when she asked him to open his mouth, she saw the universe and even saw her and Krishna in the universe with the galaxies and the stars and the planets and everything. She saw all of that in Krishna's mouth, but not the, uh, the universal form in terms of, you know, the great fearsome aspect of God uh, devouring the universe on the one hand, creating the universe on the other hand, being the source of all the demigods on the other hand, and so on and so forth. Very different. Okay. Okay, Choi's got audio now. Good. <laughs> all right, boom. Okay, another question. Uh, Daryl, I hope that works for you. Daryl, let's see. A A Aja says, what made Krishna loyal? What made Karna loyal to Duryodhana? What vow bound him thank you well gosh you know i tried to get around that by saying it's a long story and it is uh i'll try to tell it as quickly as possible in the first place karna was first known as radheya even though he was born of kunti kunti let let him go kind of like moses in a in a, a, a woven basket with swaddling clothes put on the river, I don't know if it was the river Ganges or the river Jamuna or Kalindi um, and flowed downstream right when he was born because Kunti was supposed to be a virgin and she was unmarried. And so the baby was picked up by uh, a charioteer. Uh, and his mother was named Radha. Uh, the, the charioteer's wife was named Radha and they were childless. 
and they looked at this as you know gift of god and uh, the interesting thing was that karna was born with a breastplate of armor and two uh, metallic bracelets called the uh no were the earrings i don't remember it's either earrings or bracelets called kavacha kavachas and kundalas i think it was earrings but with these kavacha and kundalas and it grew with him i mean he was he had this when he was a little little baby and and so it grew along with his body as his body grew and as long as he had those he was invincible and um not knowing that he was actually one of the Pandavas, he when uh, he 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 got military. He took military instruction from um, from the 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 uh, the incarnation of Krishna who slayed all the all the the uh, Kshatriyas. Can't remember his name, Vishwamitra. Anyway. Um, and uh, Vishwamitra finally disowned him because he did not, he, Radheya had said that he was definitely not a Kshatriya, that he was raised by Sudra, by, uh, not Sudras, but um, by a charioteer in his family. And uh, when his spiritual master, his, his military teacher, uh, rested one time after teaching him almost everything he knew. He rested on Radheya's lap, Karna's lap, and this insect came and landed on Radheya right by where his master was sleeping on his arm and he had it was described that he had a, a a nose like a like a drill and he would he was drilling into radhea's skin and radhea was like just trying to stay quiet stay not move because he didn't want to wake up his master and the blood was coming out and finally the blood dripped onto onto um, um, his mass, his uh, military master and 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 uh, he woke up, he saw what had happened and he said, you lied to me. You are a Chhatriya, no, no Brahmin, no, nobody else could put up with that kind of pain. You are a Chhatriya. And he cursed him. He said, you will, uh, when you most need it, all of your astras, all of your weapons, will leave your mind you won't be you won't be able to call any of them and uh your uh and you'll find yourself unable to move as your worst enemy slays you and this happens later during the battle of kurukshetra um but the answer to your question is that not long after this, as a young man, Karna entered the arena where the Pandavas were putting on a show, showing all the wonderful things that Dronacharya had taught them, all the magnificent feats of, of daring do and archery and, and uh, mace, you know, club, club work and, and sword fighting and all these amazing things that, that they could do. And Karna came riding in on a horse through the gate in the middle of Arjuna's performance and basically showed up Arjuna, did everything Arjuna could do and more. And Duryodhana was like, holy mackerel, now I've got the guy that can defeat Arjuna. Now I can defeat the Pandavas. And he, be def he befriended Karna, he gave him land, he gave him a palace, he gave them a title. And, and basically he said, you know, I don't want anything from you except your undivided loyalty. And Karna promised that his devotion would be only to Duryodhana. So that answers the question, right? Hope so. <laughs>
Um, let's see, who else here? Did Karna become on good terms with the Pandavas later on? No, he died during the battle of, I mean, he knew he was the only one of the six brothers who knew his relationship to the other five. The Pandavas never knew until it was until the battle was over. They didn't know that this was their very own brother that they were going up against. He was the only one who knew. And again, you might, you might think, well, maybe Krishna let him know this so that he would be at a disadvantage in the fighting, that he would not want to kill his own brother. And so there's that. And, uh, and so they didn't, they didn't make up. Uh, Karna was very much, I mean, it, it hurt him. It hurt him so deep. And partway through, as a matter of fact, he didn't even take part. He was kind of like Indrajit in the sense that he didn't take part in the first few days of the battle. I forget what excuse he had, but um, before he took part in the battle, every every day before sunrise during Brahma Muhurta, he would get up and he would worship the sun god Surya, not knowing that Surya was actually his father. Interestingly. Surya was the one who impregnated Kunti in the first place. Again, long story. But um, he would get up and he would pay his oblations and make his offerings to Surya. And he had a vow that if anyone should approach him while he is engaged in these early morning offerings, he would give them anything they wanted. Indra, the father of Arjuna, knew this. And so disguising himself as a beggar, <clears throat> he went to who was then called Radhaya, uh, and said, please, uh, uh, sir, uh, kind, sir, may I beg some, uh, some boon from you? Karna, not knowing any better, had made this vow. Yes, anything you want. Anything you want, if I can do it, I will... I will make it happen. And so Indra in disguise said, please kind sir, I want not something terribly great, but I desire your Kavacha and Kundalas. Well, Karna began to think, maybe there's more to this than meets the eye. But he had made the vow. He had offered the guy anything he wanted. And so he took a knife and he cut the breastplate and the earrings from his body, thus making him no longer invincible. And Indra knew this. And that's why he asked for it. Uh, next question. Who is Arjuna from the past life and why he is very close to Krishna? I have never read who Arjuna was in a past life, except that they are often referred to as Nara and Narayan. Nara being the firstborn, the, they're like 
they're one and yet different, just like we are. Nara and Narayan. Uh, so I don't know what else to tell you there. I don't know what, what I mean, even Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, you don't remember any of your past lives, but I remember all of mine. So I don't think that's terribly important, Ryan. Anyway, moving along. Uh, Jerry says, why do we judge others too early, accusing great, accusing great offense that did not materialize yet? I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Why do we judge others, I guess, and accuse them of some offense that has not yet materialized? Should I forgive and forget all about it? I assume, namaste Upendra, I assume that uh, that um, that's what you mean. Uh, this is, uh, we, we tend to jump to conclusions. I mean, I, I assume you're talking about, you know, people you know in your business life or your, or your work or whatever. Um, generally speaking, it's a, it's, you know, anger has its place, but when anger takes over, then you become the offender. When you can no longer see what's right and wrong. And sometimes I've been there. I, I have been so angry that I just could not see what was right in front of me. And I couldn't believe it when I was told that it was there. When we let anger take over our emotions, ever. Again, anger has a place. You can be angry at your child in order to give them instruction. You can be angry at a family member, maybe even your wife or your husband, you know, when they you're trying to correct them. But it is a tool. But if, if the tool starts handling you, then you have a problem. And a lot of us have deep-seated anger that that can come out and just overwhelm us and when we become overwhelmed with anger we've got to immediately krishna 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 please forgive me please forgive me no matter what offense this other person may have committed i am the one who's being offensive please forgive me so um I don't think you'll be able to forget it, but you can forgive. Okay, Jerry, I hope that answers your question. And Juanito, <laughs> namaste. Please accept my respects. Why Mother Kunti did not reveal to the Pandavas Radheya's identity, I assume, as their eldest brother before the war began? Well, it's interesting because when Radhea, when Radhea came into the arena and showed up Arjuna, Kunti faint, fainted because immediately she saw the Kavacha and Kundalas and she knew who it was and she fainted dead away. And um, I Again, I think it had to do with a vow that she had made that she, to, to avoid the shame of, again, having a, a child before she was married, that she had vowed never to tell anyone. And she couldn't tell Pandu. And, you know, it just, it became a non, a non issue until she saw him again. And then she just she just couldn't do it so there was probably a little more to it than that but that's basically what i remember about that aspect of the story okay um sal custodio is that why arjuna won't fight because he sees all of his relatives yeah. Haribo. Um, no, it's not just that. I mean, like I said, Arjuna 
basically looked at it and said, yeah, look at all these people that I grew up with, all of my family members, all these people that, that I've known for my entire life, and whether or not they've done something, you know, that wasn't all that great, nevertheless, what, to what end is killing them? What, to what, what good does it do? What, what is to be gained if we gain the entire kingdom and we lose our entire family? And, and friends and all of these people, what, oftentimes I'm, I'm, I'm surprised when I, when I watch a movie or I watch a television show where people will, will go to so many lengths to steal a million dollars or some other crazy thing like that. What, why? What's the point? What's the purpose? So you can enjoy life? No, you're still going to get sick. You're still going to get old. You're still going to die. All of these values. And Arjuna was basically seeing it that way. It's like, it's like, there's, it's not worth, it's not worth it. You know, even if we win, uh, to win at what cost? And indeed, the cost was very great. Uh, Kal Kalila? Kalila? Who is Kalila? What can we learn from the Mahabharat? Uh, <laughs> what is Kalila? I'm not sure, Sal, what, what you mean by Kalila. In terms of what we can learn from Mahabharat, well, that's one of the reasons why, I mean, what we can learn from Mahabharat is in the Bhagavad Gita. Any lesson that might be like I mentioned that, you know, that the demon took shelter of Arjuna instead of begging Krishna for his mercy, he asked Arjuna. And I mentioned that uh, uh, in, in, in so many ways, uh, the teachings are there, but they're couched in this story form that sometimes people have difficulty understanding. So the Bhagavad Gita is right there at the heart of the Mahabharata. And it is the soul of the Mahabharata. What can you learn from the Mahabharata? You can learn the Bhagavad Gita. That's, that's what you can learn. I hope that answers your question. Are there any other questions? That's all I've got on my chat. You can open your microphone and ask me one if you want, or you can chat a question. Unfortunately, we haven't figured out how to do um, how to do kirtan on Zoom, as there's a, apparently there's like a big delay, which makes it very difficult to do kirtan. So once we uh, run out of questions, we'll just have to say thank you very much. So if you're ready to say thank you very much, then we can we can say Haribo. Wait a minute, I've got what? Uh, oh, three more questions. Vishnu Matthews, namaste. Did Karna return to the spiritual world uh, after being killed in front of Krishna. Uh, Arjuna killed, um, it's funny because his chariot broke down, got stuck in the mud, then, then Karna couldn't remember any of his weapons, any of his astras, and, uh, and Arjuna killed him. You know, Arj I mean, Karna had, Karna, his life was just full of, he was just, every time he turned around, somebody was taking something from him. And uh, in terms of returning to the spiritual world, I'm, I'm sure just being there on the battlefield of Kurukshetra probably uh, got him at least back to the, uh, to the, um, mm, 
Narayan's, Narayan's kingdom, if nothing else. Uh, let's see, Derek says, I have a problem understanding the relationship of Lord Rama with his children. Can you please comment on this? I don't know anything about Rama's children, I have to tell you. I know nothing about Lord Rama and his children. Don't know, couldn't tell you. Uh, read the Ramayan, but I don't recall it saying very much about Ram's offspring. So I don't know what to tell you. Jerry says again, how, where, and when did Lord Rama and Sita die? Again, this is not something that's spoken of in Bhagavad Gita, and it's not something that's spoken of among devotees. We don't talk about how Krishna died, so-called died. Uh, Sita and Ram are, you know, Lakshmi and Narayan. So when their forms disappeared, I don't know. I, uh, this, I'm really focused on Bhagavad Gita and, and, you know, that kind of thing right now. So <laughs> I'm not, I'm not prepared with Lord Brahma, Lord Rama and uh, Sita Devi. Sorry for that. So, yeah, again, if there's any more questions, I think I'm out of questions right now. Um, uh, Let's see, we've been at this for 8.30, well, 9, 10, it's almost 10. Uh, we can keep going for another 10 minutes or so if, uh, if there's any other questions. If not, then thank you very, very much for uh, joining us, for being here and uh, being a part of this uh, little, first, this is the first, uh, our next uh, Zoom program will be, uh, will be for uh, introducing the Bhagavad Gita and we'll be going through the Bhagavad Gita more in terms of, I'm not going to do it verse by verse the way you often hear it, uh, but um, Acharya Das, when he asked me to do Gita class, he said that, you know, tell it as the story and, and, and work the, the teachings into it. So, Ellen, thank you very much. Anand, thank you very much for coming. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll do this again on, let's see, it's uh, Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. So our next one will be on Sunday. I hope you'll be able to join us, okay? Please do, and please tell your friends, okay? Namaste. Thank you.